Hello, beautiful souls. Welcome to the New Earth Conversation. My name is Ness. I am your host today. So those conversations are designed to help you anchor into 5D. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about the Cathar and the Cathar's prophecy with High Priestess Ishtara Rose. So welcome, Ishtara. Thank you for being here with us again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So... So let's get started with our questions. Uh, but before we start with the Cathar, I'd like you to introduce yourself very briefly and so we can get started with the crux of this um, interview, which is the Cathars. Mm. Um, so yeah, my name is Ishtara Rose. I'm a, um, a priestess of the Magdalene, high priestess of the Magdalene. I um, dedicated my life to channeling that light through and to serving her in whatever way I'm called to. Um, and so I run a mystery school and I train women to be priestesses and high priestesses. Um, and um, that's the main bit of my work, but I also have light transmissions, run ceremonies and do whatever I'm called really. So yeah that's what i i do <laughs> okay thank you very much for this introduction we've also done a um an episode with you a few weeks ago so what i'm gonna do i'm gonna post this link under this in the description box down below so you can actually um, watch this video so you will know more about uh, Ishtara Rose's work but also uh, more about the Magdalene as well. It's a very interesting interview so I warmly invite you to, um, to check it out. So today we're talking about the Cathars and I've been hearing this word Cathars a lot lately Mm -hmm. um uh and for good and for good reasons so i don't know much about the cathars to be honest so i would love you to explain us more about who they are what they are so who are the cathars okay so um the first thing i would like to say is that i'm not um a historian or an archaeologist so i'm not coming as some self-styled expert on Catharism. Um, I'm coming from the place of being a Magdalena and a priestess so I, I just talk from my heart and I had not really um, heard or connected with the Cathars particularly um, until I was on my priestess training um, and um it was then when i was in france that i started having deeper memories and connections and i was physically in the places where they were living but then of course as synchronicity happens i realized i had been living in italy a few years before in some key places i had been in the sacred sites of saint francis and had a very deep connection with him um, and looked back over my life. I'd been in traveling in Nepal and in very many different countries and looking back and piecing together <laughs> as one does all the, all the jigsaw pieces to work out and realize, you know, all the synchronicities between each thing and how everything is interrelated. Mm. So um, the Cathar came in for me with the Magdalena um, and what I receive from the Cathars is that they are the gatekeepers of that very sacred knowledge of the Magdalena and of Lemuria. Mm. And so they are very peaceful people um, and they're different groups of Magdalena followers, if you like, and the Cathars are one and they were in south of France, northern Italy and Spain. Yeah. So. <laughs> mm. so do you can you tell us when were they born and where is their stronghold if they have any? Yeah. Okay, okay. So 
Okay, so they're mainly in the south of France, northern Italy and Spain, but after the persecutions, they were heavily persecuted, and those mm. persecutions started after Eleanor d'Aquitaine died, as far as I can tell, really, that's when it started getting going, and she was really like the main protector. So the Cathars, were they transcended class, they went across all class, but they were very much protected by the royals and the aristocrats of the areas who were mainly Cathar and also protected by the Templars to a point. But the Templars were making deals all over the place with the church and other sects and places, the monarchy and so on. So it was a very complex time in history with lots of different factions of different people working in different ways. Um, the church really tried to take hold from very early on. Um, so there were always heretics and the heretics were basically any group that were not in alignment with the patriarchal values of the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. So there were other groups um, who were extensions from the Magdalena energy in the ways of the Rose and the ways of Christ, the Yeshua teachings which the Cathar felt were the first real teachings of Yeshua. And they didn't recognize the teachings of the Catholic church at all. And it wasn't the Christ that they knew. So they actually were quite extreme and said that the Catholic church for them was the church of Satan. And they worshiped this crucifixion, which was a cross, an instrument of torture. Whereas the Cathar cross is like a Coptic cross and it's, it's um, you know, equal. So, um let's say it's a very different a very different symbolism um and so there were different groups of heretics in the in europe at, um you know throughout history throughout the, these dark years of history if you mm. like um and one of them was the Manchaean um, Manchaeism and um that was sort of linked to the Cathar and um, they were also um, persecuted heavily. And um, then there were other groups like the Gnostics. Um, there were lots of different groups and they were all sort of very um, similar. So it's quite hard to generalize. And like I said, I'm not a historian. Um, the Cathars really were first talked about in the 11th and 12th century, as far as I can tell when their records of mass burnings um, starting to happen. Mm. <laughs> yeah. so, can you give us the essence of their teachings and their philosophy? So you've talked about different groups and mm. they all seem to have, to carry the essence of the Magdalena. Mm. So, so Mary Magdalene came over to south of France mm. um, carrying this very beautiful light. And there's a reason she came to south of France. And south of France is um, uh, it's a very sacred land. It's actually very linked to Egypt, but it was an ISIS cult. There are particular areas in France which hold energy. Um, so a lot of sacred icons were taken there, but also pre-existed there from prehistory so you know you can find uh, there's a goddess sculpture that was found that was dated at 24,000 BC and what I get through my meditations is that's just the beginning it goes way back even before that so south of France is a very sacred Isis cult area you know and this is why Magdalena went there because she was an Isis priestess so she took this light and she went back to this place that was calling her and the Cathars continued her teachings and her work amongst all the other groups and there are places in the south of France that are far more ancient really than we're told a bit like the Egyptian pyramids you know we're told they're so, you know so old but actually other people believe they're way way older than that um, there are key sites in the south of France a bit like that, that are much, much older than we're led to believe. And um, I know locals there who feel like some of the sacred sites are actually pyramids going deep into the ground that have been covered up. So there's a lot of secrets. Mm -hmm. um, and the Cathar were um, the gatekeepers of those secrets, if you like. 
mm. or all that knowledge yeah. yeah so is this knowledge has been completely buried or destroyed or uh, is there still reminiscence of that of these teachings mm. that we can actually find or you know tap into maybe the knowledge went underground when they were when it became dangerous to hold either you were murdered or um it you didn't want it to get into the wrong hands so it was taken underground and of course there's the book of love which um is a beautiful symbol um some people think it is a real scroll containing the teachings um for other people it's symbolic of the knowledge that they held, the wisdom, so much knowledge. Um, so they were the knowledge went underground as they went underground, and many different um, further orders would, you know, the Cathars fled, like the Templars actually. Um, they did survive. A lot of people say that they were, were annihilated, and Balibas was the last Cathar to be murdered, and but who who was alive. What I get when I meditate, um, very very clearly is that they did survive um, very much so and they took the teachings all over the world and some uh, very secret orders were set up so I think I really believe again this comes through my meditation and not through history but I really believe that St Francis was a Cathar who was teaching Catharism the way of the rose Mm. Um, and so many many orders that had other names but were really teaching the same thing mm. and very gentle often and quite quiet yeah mm. so the Cathars were men and women teaching that or Cathars, following men and women they were priests yeah. and priestesses yeah okay yeah. priests and priestesses who were working holding to- holding the the, the Magdalene energy the magdalene light yeah um so now i'd like to talk about um montségur montségur le montségur that's what how we say because i'm french so this is how we say it in french le montségur um can you tell us more about this place Mm -hmm. yeah so um I'm just going to channel if that's all right, right? Yes, of course. It is okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just want to see what's going to come through here. The first thing I want to share is about Last Tours and not Monsegur. Mm. Um, Last Tours is, um, um, there's so much energy that comes through me when I talk about the Cathar. So right from the moment we started this interview, um, mm. I, it's like they enter the space and it's very powerful and emotional for me yeah so that's how it first was when I connected to the Cathar and um how it is for a lot of people you know um not just because of the genocides that happen so there's a lot of trauma and pain there but also because they're so peaceful and there's such a delicate and beautiful energy here so it's a very sacred sacred thing mm-hmm. um so last tours was um a portal into middle earth <laughs> um and i know to some people that sounds totally way out but i'm sure most people listening to this are open to those kind of things um last tours was and is a portal to middle earth and it's a very sacred portal and a lot of people go to Montsegur, but Last Tours is a really important place. Um, and there are tunnels and caves all interconnected below the land and, and through and around all the way to Carcassonne and beyond, r- relating to this ISIS um, cult. I, I don't really like the word cult, but you know, um, <laughs> the matriarchy that once existed, it's all related. And, um, and so, I just wanted to say that about last tour so that's holding a particular energy and then all the sacred sites like all the sacred sites of the earth but particularly in south of france are holding particular frequencies and gateways and they all map up and connect up Mm. so there are also myths that the uh, sacred stones of the ark of the covenant are there and renle chateau of course when the, the book holy blood holy grail was released um, that really opens 
um, the entire Magdalene movement. And without that book, none of this would be happening. People wouldn't be talking about this now. So that, that's a really important book. And of course, it was later uh, ripped off by um, Da Vinci Code, you know, and um, and that's another story. But um, Michael Bajent, one of the authors of that book, um, also went on to write something called the Jesus Papers, where he was in Italy and he discovered this network of beautiful and amazing underground uh, tunnels and caves in a place called Baia near Naples. And um, when he he did go in with a team of archaeologists, but when he tried to get uh, go further with it, they got, he would actually be pointing at a gateway and they deny that it was there. You know, they just had to deny it. Mm. And that's the same as France. And every sacred site of the world, really, it's been turned into a gift shop or a this or a that. So it's either been owned and shown, hidden in plain sight, so mm. that you can't even see it because of the whole um, tourist thing built over it, like Stonehenge or somewhere. Or it's been totally hidden and forgotten about and, lit and trees grown over it. And so no one even knows it it exists that it's there or all, all days like in Syria Iran and Iraq in 2014 when all the sacred sites that have stood for tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of years are literally in 2014 bulldozed, um, or turned into a motorway or a McDonald's even you know so um so I just wanted to say that about <laughs> sacred sites um so coming back to last tours that is a really key place for Middle Earth. Um, and Montségur is another. So Montségur was fortified um, really by um, a woman called Esclamon de Foix, who was an aristocrat at the time, who um, had had, she was older woman, she had had a, a, a life, a marriage, children, blah, blah, blah. And then she took her um, consolamentum, which is her, baptism if you like or light initiation um after that life in her sort of you know mid-age and um because she had access to wealth and power she was able to plow money into Montsegur because she knew what was coming <laughs> and she was called the fox by the church because she was always one step ahead and they could never capture her mm -hmm. So she was really behind the um, fortification and the rebuilding of Montségur as a, a safe site because she knew, uh, you know, things were tough. There was a lot of tension um, around. And so she had the foresight to do that and the power to do that. Um, and there are actually quite a few Escaramons at the time. Um, she was the main one that's people really refer to when they talk about her and history but there were others at the same time so one was um her niece who was um this is a whole long story I don't know whether to go into the story <laughs> <laughs> how much do I share but um just keep going <laughs> yeah no so so yeah, one was her niece anyway, who um, her brother, uh, the, the Eskimo de Foix, her brother, they were a key family in the area. And he, the story goes that he was uh, hunting a wolf one night and he, I think he killed the wolf actually, I'm not sure, but he got lost. He came across a convent. He went into convent and made love with the abbess of the convent and she gave birth to two twins. And one they named uh, was a boy and they named after the wolf and the other was a girl and they named her after her aunt, Esclamond, um, which it was quite a common name at the time, but not common in the sense that if you were given that name, there was a reason. It was a powerful name to hold and you sort of had to live up to it, you know. Mm. Um, so she was given that name and um, of course in French you're French so my French friend told me it's more like a lightning bolt of um, éclair, uh, éclair. Mm, éclair. Yeah, yeah like a lightning bolt like a uh, mm -hmm. yeah it is uh, an éclair is a lightning bolt yeah 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 so um, she 
she was meant to be quite feisty um when i when i meditate i get images of her and her white horse she really reminds me of my daughter they're like the same being you know my daughter came in once in a meditation <laughs> you know just so like bossy <laughs> <laughs> She knows what she wants. <laughs> you, know, yeah, you know, no fear. Yeah. <laughs> the whole thing out. And, um, and then, um, and she had many lovers, apparently, um, even though she was married. She was married to a count all in a place called Montelieu. And Montelieu is really important. It's a very sacred place. And there's a lot going on there. And that's... Montelieu. Yeah, Montelieu. I feel like we should um, list all these sacred sites in France. And yeah, just there's so many. Put them, back, put them back into a map, you know? I think it's yeah. something we should be doing. And it is something, it is, I, I would love to travel around those places and visit them and just um, honor, them, honor them for what they are, you know? So that the energies can be remembered. Mm. And those places can be also be remembered. I think it's it's important, mm. and mm. and um, yeah, and just to 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 share that with other people who are opening up or awakening and who are curious about curious about those uh, those places. Um, mm. It doesn't mean that we want to turn these places mainstream, but just to so that people can reconnect with with these energies and and i'm sure they fill with light codes and activating codes and mm -hmm. so that they will they will activate within us what we have forgotten basically mm -hmm. or maybe we have live you know we have lived in those areas we have mm -hmm. probably worked with this energy and then mm -hmm. there was a time maybe where we knew what these places meant what these energies meant um i'd love to do that one yeah. day. You yeah, know a lot about uh, the area. I'm I'm actually French, but I don't know much to be well, yeah. there. My friend, he lives near Carcassonne, and he's born and bred, and he's like he a lot of hills, and he knows a lot. So he's really, really fascinated and passionate about all of this. And he is spending a lot of time in Montelieu at the moment because he's discovered stuff there, and oh, um, and places he's just he's discovered uh, other people know about because there's a cathar a little secret cathar monument in a cave that mm. someone visits now and again that he's discovered you know things like that mm. yeah those, so, those places are coming yeah. back to life and they mm. we are rediscovering them and for good reasons mm. so should i go back to montsegur yes yeah so um just carrying on with that story of the esclamon the, the third esclamon is um the daughter of um oh just on just the second esclamon her husband who was a lord of montelieu he was his record was found as someone who died on the fires in perpignan mm -hmm. but he didn't survive that's recorded um, so the third Esclamond is, um, was much younger and she was the daughter of a Lord of Montségur. So at the time of the siege in Montségur, which was 1244, there was, um, there were three Esclamonds there. Um, there was the mature, and it's like the triple goddess, right? There's the mature Esclamond, the, the mother, the queen. Mm -hmm. There's the feisty, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, one who led the men into battle with no fear. And then there's the younger one. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just feel like I've never shared my story. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> you do? We'd love I, to hear it. This is an opportunity to share mm -hmm. a little bit because I'm quite private, but just a little bit of what, what happens for me at this particular point when I regress mm -hmm. and what led me to this um, was that when I was undertaking my high priestess initiations um, I was with my French friend who was my lover at that time um, and I'd been through a really difficult divorce with the father of my own children so I was raw and um, sort of you know uh, building myself up and um, my French friend I'd known uh, 15 years previously when we traveled in a circus together actually, and he was a performance artist and he was, uh, he's a bit old, he's 15 years older than me. 
and we hadn't seen each other for 15 years and it, anyway I really wanted to go to south of France and do some initiations there and I was going to go and see a teacher there um, who I'd read about and had a few connections with but anyway I ended up through one thing and another going to see him instead and and then you know we became very intimate over a period of a few years and I kept going out to see him um for weekends or weeks you know whenever the children's dad was in England and taking the children I would go and see him and and so I went through many initiations in all the sacred places of south of France with him by my side and all just holding space so it was a really beautiful time and every time we went somewhere it happened often to be empty or closed so it was special because it would mean that, for example, when I first sat with the skull of Mary Magdalene, St. Maximin, it was closed. So he would guard and I went down <laughs> and broke in, you know, with my I, my iPhone torch. Mm. I would end up sitting with these icons on my own in the dark, you know, and this happened again, actually, in um, the actual um, church of St. Baum in the lower cave which was closed and slumped down and he held space it happened quite a few times and it also happened in Montsegur mm -hmm. and we because and it happened in Montsegur because it happened we went in a December and it was just totally empty and no one was around we went a few times and the other time it was empty because it was raining <laughs> it was like heavily raining and we just went for it but this time we went in December it's very sunny and beautiful day and no one was around and we went up we climbed up to the top it's quite a steep hike up obviously you know it takes a few hours or whatever and um yeah so I did this meditation at the top and everything came I mean everybody who goes there will relate to what I'm saying because it's such a sacred place and um it's really hard to explain that kind of experience but everyone listening will know that when you're in a place that you have that connection it's like this emotion comes that's so deep and timeless it can make no sense and you'll just feel so moved you know mm. so um there was a lot of that going on and then I did this regression and I'm always wary of past life regressions some I'm very happy to claim and say that was me and and as myself and then some I just feel like different souls can come into different you can carry the energy of a soul as a soul tribe, you know, and so relive a life as if you are that person. Mm. And um, so what happened for me when I was sitting there is I became the younger Escamond and her name was Estelle. Mm. And she was, when I was her, I was 17. Mm -hmm. And... Um, <sighs> And I was a priestess and the Templars came and they tried to make a deal. And it was very difficult times. And the, temp the Templar who came, um, uh, <laughs> he, um, he was making deals left, right and center. And he was a good man, but couldn't totally be trusted, you know? Mm. So, and also they're not used to women being in this space and being, being powerful and I was only 17 right and I you know as I remember this and so then um and then I, I flash forward to this other moment when I went with a guide and I was carrying scrolls and going through um tunnels and pathways and what I get is that I swapped places with the other Esclamonde so that um, she was the one who went on the fire. Mm. And um, there's a lot of emotion around that as I, mm. as I relive as her, honoring that, mm. that's a lot to hold. And then- I feel it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and just bear in mind, I'm not saying me, me, I'm saying I am regressing as if, okay? Mm. And so as I'm coming down this, pathway there is this man who, who so if my trusted beautiful guide is taking me and then we're attacked and um 
you know, it's really horrendous. So I'm taken into a cave and a hand goes over my mouth, but it's a good man who's holding me and he's chanting around me to stop my light body, you know, stop me shooting out my body in trauma because my trusted guide is being murdered. So I'm, he's just holding me and I know he's a good man and I'm just, we're just two of us together are just bringing my soul back in and trying to keep me together, you know? Mm. And then we go further in to Middle Earth and as a priestess of the Cathar, I have this connection to um, Middle Earth portals and can uh, commune and transcend into them. Mm. And um, so that's a whole other journey. (laughs) (laughs) And then at one point um, there are cartloads of priestesses and the Templar from before is going to take them. Um, and I tr- absolutely trust him because although he's not trustworthy in the sense he's making deals left, right and centre and he's into money and power and whatever, he, he has made his vows to the goddess. So I know that his order, his raison d'etre mm. is to protect these priestesses. So he won't go against that no matter what he's like. So I absolutely trust that. And I know these priestesses with these scrolls are safe and we're all super equal and powerful. It's not, there's no hierarchy here. Mm. And so that happened and I went to get on the last cart. I didn't, I, I went into the caves again. And there's this moment that I remember where I know he's just realized and it's like ages later that I'm not on the last cart. And he's like, you know, like, shit, she's not there. And he knows he'll never get those scrolls. And I'm holding them, and they're symbolic of the knowledge, mm. holding them in the caves. And I can feel his energy. And I just, you know, I can feel him as if, as if he's standing before me, like you've eclipsed me, but I had no choice, you know. And the Cathar had to take the scrolls underground. They had to. Mm. so that is sort of a a dream and regression there's there's loads more to it loads more to it amongst many other dreams and regressions I've had Mm -hmm. as other figures in the whole sort of history (laughs) Mm. that relates to Montsegur and that comes in here and it is so relevant to 2021 and what is happening Mm -hmm. (laughs) right now and so relevant to the falls of Egypt and the falls of Atlantis and it's the same story and the French Revolution with Marie Antoinette it's the Mm -hmm. same story all the way through again and again yeah so tell us about this story being why is 2021 so important why is it so relevant and so important Belle Bast was a um he was a Cathar who was caught um, and tricked into being caught. Um, he was actually living in Spain, but he was tricked to go back into France and he was, he was arrested and um, he, he knew he was, he was done for and um, he, he was going to be murdered. So during his court case, he said, um, so he, you know, he, they asked him, um, you know, they were asking lots of questions and the man doing the court case was sort of writing it all down. So this is recorded in history. But he said a descendant of the House of Aragon and the House of Aragon often represents the Magdalena. Mm. And he said a descendant of the House of Aragon will raise its white horse upon the altars of Rome. And, um, you know, nation will fight against nation. Um, and the, you know, basically Rome will fall and the laurel will turn green. You know, you can read or research the exact thing elsewhere, but that's the general message of what he said. And um, so he said the timeline, this would happen um, in seven centuries from now. And so when he was talking, seven centuries took it, um, takes it to now, to today. Um, so 2021 is exactly 700 years from when Balibas said that, mm-hmm. but it's also 777 years from the siege, the burning at Montsegur. 
um, and um, this thing of the laurel turning green has sort of been, you know, confused people over time. And for me as a priestess, I absolutely feel everything to be symbolic. And so the symbolism of that, the turning green, what I'm getting, and in fact, just in the last few weeks of March, <laughs> what I'm getting is people, so many people just talking about visions of green lights, green emeralds, like green goddesses, goddesses appearing holding green jewels, you know, mm. and this is the green of love, the heart chakra, it's the green of the earth, it's the dragons rising up, the ley lines opening, and um, the laurel, of course, is the symbol of Rome and of victory. But it, this, for me, the laurel turning green means Rome becoming love again. And so I like to call it amor, being restor restored to Roma, which mm. is, you know, the reverse again, it, again, it being reversed again. So here we are in 21, this time of this prophecy and you know, here I am talking, not knowing anything about the Cathar, particularly up until recently, really. And then suddenly having visions and memories. And I know I'm not the only one. And that so many of us who have like never even maybe even heard of the Cathar last year, even suddenly finding themselves either listening to this interview with me or somewhere else or someone else. And so I had a, a girl who came to me for a private reading. Mm. And this is where it all started it, it began yeah. isn't it so let, let, let's talk about that that's so interesting okay the catalyst for something for for this to happen actually. yeah so that was only last month and she came and um at the time i had met somebody who i thought and feel still was the incarnation in this lifetime of that templar mm. and we just met and connected and at the same time, I had this reading with this girl and stuff was coming up with my previous lover in France. Um, he, he was discovering, he was still very, very close. Um, he was discovering things in um, Montelieu. And, um, and so it was all happening, you know, how it does, mm -hmm. just all within days. And then this priestess started talking about things like, in her visions with the scrolls that were the same as everything I've just talked about. And um, I love it when that happens. I've had other regressions, you know, where I've lived entire lives and know nothing about that period of history and then Googled it and it's like, oh my God, you know, it's all there. And mm. yeah, it's, it's just amazing. And, and every time it's amazing. And um, so that happened with her and before I knew it, um, literally within days I, I'd organized this ceremony by Zoom and I knew it had to be about last tours but that's all I knew. Mm -hmm. um, I had this very, in fact the photo behind me on my altar is on oh, yeah. tours and um, <laughs> when I went to see my friend there a year ago literally a few weeks before lockdown hit we'd had this very special weekend there and I jumped on a plane and um, the clouds parted and there was last tour so I took a photo and then we were in the cloud again and um, so it's a really sacred photo for me but um, uh, so this beautiful girl <laughs> basically was mirroring my own process with all the other things in my own life and this person other man that I'd met and there's so much to say about him and his because he was working very deeply with the Cathar mm. as a healer and all his clients are Cathars and so, but that's his own personal and private story. So I won't really share about that. But um, so we came together in this very sort of like, like a bit of like a thunderstorm energy between us as two teachers um, and healers and um, did a ceremony um, over a full moon and to clear Templar Cathar connections. And, um, and then I've continued that work on my own, um, in my own ways. So I did, at the same time, I did the Zoom call and then ended up, so everyone could talk about it, opening this Facebook group. And then suddenly I was, you know, told very clearly by spirit, they wanted me to do this 
other ceremony on Monsignor. So did, I've only done the two ceremonies and there's this space mm. for people to commune, but it's really beautiful, yeah. So, so that those are the last two ceremonies you've done. Mm. I've done both of them. The, the first one that was in La Store, mm. Mary Magdalene. I remember the skull as well. I remember that skull because it was so powerful. I felt the skull was my skull. That's why oh, wow. I was like, she was holding it, but I was like, I feel like she's holding my skull. Wow. It was so, <laughs> it was yeah. really interesting, you mm. know, to know that the skull she had in her hand was actually my skull. Mm. So must have felt a lot of light come into your head. Yes, yeah. a lot of light. So um, those two ceremonies are on your face group, uh, Facebook group. Can you remind us the name of the Facebook group? Oh, so the Facebook group is called Cathars of Light. Cathars uh, of Light. And the actual ceremonies are on my website. You just can, you can download from from my website. Yes. yes. So I'm going to talk about my own experience with them. So I've done both of them so the first one I actually you've sent me the the recording and mm. oh boy it was so powerful but like really intensely powerful and it was so healing but on this on on a very 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 deep level I I it was really it moved me a lot it, it needed two or three days to actually recover from that mm. and the second one that you've done on Monday, last Monday, mm. just a few days ago, mm. it was a very different feel. So you, you took us through tunnels. We met Estelle that you've mentioned earlier. I remember we met this little child from Lemuria who was really wise. Mm. And we went down to move to Lemuria. Mm. And I, I realized that I was a man. <laughs> I was a male, very loving with my wings my uh, light wings mm. and i love going back to lemuria when we regress because it's such a beautiful it, it has it holds such a beautiful energy and mm. so loving and nurturing and peaceful and uh, there is no words to describe you need to you need to feel it to understand how it feels but um and so i remember I remember that from this ceremony, but also the feeling was really different. The first one was a very deep, as if it was going deep within us and it was like a transmutation and a healing. Mm -hmm. And the other one um, was filled with light. Mm -hmm. Both were filled with light, but was, was the first one was about really cleansing and clearing, healing, purifying. The second yeah. one was, yeah. it, it felt so light. The energies were quite high because it was just mm -hmm. after the, the equinox. So the energy was, were very high, but I felt very filled with light, mm -hmm. um, filled with love. Um, I think that's the best way to describe it. They had a two, for me anyway, they had two really different feelings. Mm -hmm and meaning as well because the experience was really different mm -hmm. so if you are interesting please interested please go to the group page the cathars of light cathars of light or just contact me yeah yes or contact directly ishtar rose so you can uh, get into this group and do these beautiful um ceremonies mm. um more um i'm sure there'll be many more yeah yes yeah. and a lot of people were in the second uh ceremony the first one i've done in i think i've done it a few days later but mm. i couldn't be there mm. um but the second one i was there and there were about like 80 people mm. uh, on the call so a lot of people are gathering a lot of people are um reconnecting with the cathars and bringing back that energy mm. on the planet mm. so there are a few things so i'd like to clarify so monsegur is a place mm. but it's also very uh it's just like just like last store it's a bit like a stronghold of the cathar isn't it it's, it's a stronghold yeah and um it's, it is also a portal yeah a portal as well yeah so in the Monsegur ceremony mm. um, we went deep into Lemuria and mm. this is because the Katha are the guardians of Lemuria and this is why they were wiped out by the church you know in the same way they had a genocide against women and mm. you know, murdered and burnt women mm. um so um they needed to just eradicate all of that 
history of um, mm. Lemuria in Atlantis, actually. So, um, so this, the Cathar are the guardians of that. And that's why, you know, it's often people think of the Cathar and then they have this association of this persecuted, horrendous, burning on bonfire, traumatic time. Mm. But actually, I feel like those of us on the last two ceremonies have cleared all of that and other people doing their own work because there are a lot of people doing really deep and special work with the Cathars, you know, all over the world and in France. And that has been cleared. And that's the amazing thing that all of this, like I didn't plan, oh, it's 21, it's the year of the prophecy. I know, let's do it. It just happened like that. And that's why, that's why it's so amazing and so incredibly special that this girl just came to me you know I wasn't even thinking particularly about it mm. happening like that you know a month before mm. so um and so this year of the prophecy it's all my yeah my point is that the energy has been cleared so it's not like oh is it going to clear and is the cat it has been like mm -hmm. that trauma is cleared mm. so now we can clear carry on clearing on different because there are always layers and levels and so there's going to be repercussions of the trauma that need shifting but we can do it quite fast now because mm. the times are really fast so we can clear and shift and the times the activations are here the energy is here it's the time is ripe to clear it so it means okay. we can clear it fast so it has been cleared and anything any residue can be cleared really quick so when we now think of the Cathars, we can think of not of this prophecy that's going to come true, but this prophecy that has come true, mm. light has been restored, those energy lines have been restored, the dragon who represents the divine feminine energy has risen and, 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 and it's happened, yeah, and is continuing to happen. Mm. And um, funny yeah. enough, someone wrote to me, I don't know what's going on in the world at the moment. Um, <laughs> in terms of, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. but you just don't know what the truth is of stuff. And someone wrote to me about the um, Vatican and all the different, there's so many different theories of how the power has been taken from the Vatican at the moment. And the person who wrote to me was not coming from a priestess place at all <laughs> mm. but I just thought isn't that interesting you know that all this this stuff is happening with the Vatican at the same time you know mm. very yeah. interesting the power is now being yeah mm. the, the power is being taken from them because the true power is being restored yes and has been truth, truth is being it has been restored and it is is being restored basically yeah. As we speak, um, so there are a few things I'd like to talk about um, that you have mentioned earlier. So you've mentioned the book of love, mm. the holy blood, the holy grail, and the Jesus paper. So those are books which are very activating from what I understand. They're really those are books that you've mentioned. So is it books that we can actually buy or they uh, are not available? That was a, um, it's a myth, if you like, a legend. That Which one? The Book of Love. Uh -huh. Okay, so can you it's tell us more about the legend? The book that the Cathar had of their teachings that they took into hiding. And other people believe it's symbolism for the knowledge and the wisdom, the Book of Love being mm. the, the teachings you carry in your heart you know so it could be both isn't it both are actually relevant yeah find I, I feel anyway and the chalice comes into this and the chalice is the same so the cathars were supposed to have the chalice and mm. you know, some people the chalice represents lots of different things and for some people it is the actual cup of the last supper for other people it's the cup that came through egypt that is from the covenant that is you know possibly from sirius or you know somewhere else that um is a really sacred icon icon meaning something that transmits light mm -hmm. of the divine feminine and then for other people the chalice represents is just a symbol that represents that mary magdalene had children and that's what the book the holy blood holy grail talks about 
And then for me, the chalice is represents the portal of the divine feminine that every single woman, whether she has a womb in her or not, mm. <laughs> you know, um, holds. And that is the sacred womb um, power that when you connect your womb to your heart and you activate and open them, you hold the chalice. Mm. So you hold the book of love and you hold the chalice. Mm. So these are two icons that are um, very relevant to the, to the story of the Cathar. Mm. And do you think we, we should have a, just suggesting that, we should have a ceremony where we connect and activate those symbols within us yeah, well, to that's, actually hold that vibration? That's happened in those two ceremonies. But oh, yes. Yeah. And maybe, yeah, maybe that's a, a really good thing. Yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> A little suggestion there. I remember you talking about the book of love, indeed. Yes, the second one was. There are many layers to those so Yes. I say, you know, you can re listen, but it all goes through subconscious to the subconscious anyway. Mm, because it was really layered, I remember. And then at some point, you, you just allow the energies to come to, to do the work because in that state of you know meditative state you're in trance-like state basically so you just allow those words to wash over you so you don't pick up everything because you're in that state already but i remember you talking about the book of love and i thought oh interesting i try to keep them to an hour and mm -hmm. but really i'm packing in four hours of meditation into that one hour really mm -hmm. be a lot longer gaps and the beauty of re-listening is that you can actually pause yep go deeper into each thing if you yeah see. yeah i will do them again actually both of them because they hold different frequencies mm -hmm. you can tell um and yes yeah, so if you could do i don't know another suggestion for the book of love and the holy blood holy grail to activate the both holy of them blood, holy grail is an actual book that was oh. that was written by three people um Hen uh, michael Bage and henry lincoln and I can't remember the third author. Should I Google that? I should Google that. Oh. Yes. Um, I'll definitely look into those these books. I'm, I'm quite intrigued now. The Holy Grail, Holy Blood. Is that the same book or is it two books? Holy Book. Henry Lincoln and Michael Bajant. Okay. So three authors. Um, mm. so that's a really important book. Um, mm. That was the book. They, they were, um, so Michael Bajant, um, had a lot of knowledge, at, or well, all of them did, um, but they came together to write this book um, and they got really slated for it. Mm. <laughs> it was a lot for them to have to do and present to the world. Mm. And in this book, they present the idea of Mary Magdalene as equal to Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. as a possible priestess, as having been the mother of their of a blood whole bloodline. Um, and so much more. So they opened all of that mm. in this book. And um, they talk about, it's really centered around Ren Le Chateau, mm -hmm. place in the Long Dock, um, um, which lots of people listening, I'm sure, know about. Or if not, you can go down an entire rabbit hole of <laughs> years worth of research with that. Mm. Um, so, and when I meditate on Renle Chateau, I actually always feel Mary Magdalene to be in Provence where um, her cave was. Like when I connect with her in France, I really feel her there very powerfully. When I go to Renle Chateau, I really feel Lazarus, her brother. Mm. He was said to be in Marseille, but actually I feel him in Renle Chateau and I know he was guarding something very sacred there. Yeah. Mm. And that's when I talk I'm just getting all this blue light coming in and that's the blue light of Lazarus and that's the blue lights that were coming in um in the second ceremony and the first but yeah that's this and that's what this this work is all about it's about activating that blue light again so it's not about the knowledge in the mind it's the book of love of the heart and activating that energy of that blue light yeah that he was holding and that she was holding. Mm. Yeah. I feel so peaceful right now. Just <laughs> yeah. to say you've mentioned both of them and that blue light as well. It feels wonderful. Um, and the Jesus papers, is it something we could also have access to? Is it a book it's we that's can? A book that Michael Bajant wrote. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, 
he he wrote quite a few books he went on to write a few books mm. um, he is just that I mentioned that because in that book he he talks about this sacred site in Italy mm -hmm. yeah okay. I'll definitely will look into these books mm. um I've got <laughs> I'm reading books at the moment and on all of them there is a title on the title there is one word in common <laughs> Magdalene <laughs> four with Magdalene on them <laughs> it's either the Magdalene this or the Magdalene that you know um so I'm definitely in that uh energy and I'm reconnecting with with this uh with that energy altogether and reactivating it within me so um, it is happening mm. it is happening mm. um it's happening for many people for many people, yes. Now she's now waking her priestesses up. She definitely does. She came to find me a few a few years ago, and I didn't believe it. I I was actually, to be honest, rejecting it a little bit. I was like, oh well, I, I you know I've heard things about you, Mary Magdalene. You know, like it's because I was, I was programmed for this. N not really, but but slowly but surely, I've I've actually made my transition into reconnecting with what she truly is and um when i've realized that i've just switched it was really quick for me to to, to switch that because i just needed to clear that false belief system false belief that was actually um, that i've that i've been told basically um and um i had a reading with a friend so um, it was in 2019 or 2018. Uh, we would gather with friends who were all a little bit psychic and, you know, mediums and channelers and, and all of that. And then we, we had cards and then he picked up a card and he said, oh, Mary Magdalene one is speaking through me right now. And he said, he, she said, she's asking you to see her as the equal of Jesus. This is his specific words. And I was like, oh, how, how interesting. So that that stayed. I was like, OK, because I didn't really think about, you know, it. I wasn't I wasn't judgmental in no in, in any ways. I was just so that's the story that they wanted us to believe. So it didn't really resonate. But I was like, who really knows what happened then? And then as I got called to reawaken and those messages start to pop in again where Mary Magdalene was asking me to see her specific the equal as Jesus but on on a female body basically or the female version of what Yeshua is, is all about mm -hmm. and that was helpful because it actually helped me clear that false belief that was there that didn't really stuck with me but that was just it, it just needed to be to be cleansed and what I found later on is that those false belief beliefs about male and female were so to speak within me where I saw women less than men what the patriarchy was trying to actually spread across so I had to do this work where I, I was seeing women or the female as equal as the male in a in the different way uh, and some I had to do this work to be able to carry on um, my journey as a as a priestess and that was very powerful mm. to do because I couldn't see myself I, I had to restore that truth within me and that really triggered so many beautiful things first of all the awakening of the divine feminine energy within me mm. um, the awakening of um, the 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 caduceus within me uh, restored that energy of divine union within. I could feel the energy taking back her, her space and place, and the divine masculine and those two energy working together. So it is really important. So anybody watching us today you know just going back into your mind and just seeing how you see yourself in relation to men or how men see themselves in relation to women and if you see a disbalance that needs to be restored because that needs to be cleared and healed because this will allow you to then 
fully embody who you are without seeing yourself as less than or better than the other. You, do you know what? I, it's not coming from a distorted place. It's coming from a place of truth mm. and equality. And for me, that was really important. So I'm really grateful for that message from Mary Magdalene to really point it out in that reading, you know, with my friend. I love what you say because it's so important. And um, I always get that message from Mary Magdalene that... Mm. We always it's very beautiful to read these books or learn these things or listen to these interviews but then we have to do it for ourselves and that's mm -hmm. the path of the magdalene that is the path of the cathar it's a path of gnostic and gnostic means direct experience oh and, wonderful uh, yeah manda means the same thing that like knowledge direct knowledge and you only get direct knowledge through your own experience so what everything you were just saying that you, you have some concept of male and female, but then you have to go on that path yourself in your own life, in your own stories, in your own trauma, and you have to go through possibly a few dark nights mm. to really hold it and understand it for yourself. Mm. So it's not a concept or you're not communing with the divine through another or through another teacher. The only teachers that you have are people who are there to support you mm. and your own direct connection as you walk that path and to support you as you walk that path because it is quite a difficult path at times to to walk the path of truth because you mm. have to face all the things you were just talking about within yourself and absolutely yeah mm. and do you know what was what it was creating within me unconsciously is that I was trying to I was always battling mm. against man I was trying to justify that I was a woman and I was equal I thought I was that was it but I was coming from a place of feeling less than so I was trying to make up for that mm. difference which yeah. had to be restored in my mind in my feelings in my body in my you know as a whole I had to lift myself up on the same level as a man mm. and because otherwise everything that I was doing was coming from a distorted place and that wasn't it was only it was only a um siphoning my energy away from me mm. because unconsciously there was this belief mm. that was just siphoning my power and my energy away so doing this work was extremely powerful so i'm not saying that everybody will resonate with this but because we are coming from this patriarchal you know society which is rampant still everywhere it is changing it is being lifted we know it um but those belief ha needs to be cleansed and cleared and purified and restored to their true meaning and, and that's really important so anybody who is on the path of the, the, the divine feminine or the priestess it, I think it's something that you need to look into and when when that truth you know that truth was being shown to me I was like oh really I thought that was I, I, I thought I didn't have to I, I thought I was clear with that but I wasn't and I felt the difference I felt the distortion and it, it, it allowed me to actually feel that distortion to welcome it and be like okay now let's restore this let's restore my divine feminine power to its true meaning to its true power to its true place that was so that was great may i add to that that when you talk about restoring the power that's what the ceremonies are about so although mm. it's for the cathar it's the cathar is symbolic for for the woman and the woman is symbolic for the feminine essence within both man and woman so this yes. is yeah, yeah. And, and so you talk about restoring that energy and also I'd like to bring in the word reclaim mm. because I feel, and I, I have these words in spirit that this is about returning what was taken. Yes. Something was taken mm. and it needs to be returned. And this is about each one of us in our own personal stories and personal lives, reclaiming our light, reclaiming our power, our sovereignty, our worth, Mm. for ourselves and that's a journey yeah mm. that's yeah. beautiful thank you would you like to add anything on the cathars do you think there is anything relevant we should be talking about um so um 
Yeah, I mean, I'm really feeling them present as, um, and the way they are for me is, I just got the word blood come up then. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that's interesting. I wonder what that's about. Sorry, I just saw it on my screen. Um, that's obviously wanting to come into this call for a reason. So what mm -hmm. I was just, I'm just going to talk to see what happens. But what I was going to say is I'm really feeling the cathar in this call um, as a whole. Like I get them as this uh, being that it's like they're in white and they're holding this bright white light and they come as a whole, like a whole group of them. So, um, so that's really beautiful. So they're really present. And a very beautiful connection with a Katha uh, monk who I call Iyasu, who um, in Minerva, another sacred place, very sacred place, and 150 um, Katha brothers, priests, were burnt there on Magdalene feast day, um, a year after Bezier, when 20,000 mm. were um, burnt. And this 150, the very um very sacred brotherhood mm. and so he came to me when I was actually sitting doing a blood ceremony uh, with my menstrual blood um in a river uh so I waded up the river so I was in a <laughs> I don't know where I was but um and really felt them all come in then um and he was present and in fact when he was present this dog started kicking off in the background like this this in a really aggressive way and his message was and it felt related to what had happened there and his message was that you know all this shit can be kicking off over there and it's not about disconnecting and looking the other way you can look at it you can hear the dog you can face the dog you can hear the aggression or the, the shit going on in the world or the, the romans coming in to burn them or what's going on in 21 today in this day and age so it's not about not looking at it, you can see it, um, but it's about not engaging with it and remaining here with me, he was saying, in this place of love. Mm. So you can hear the dog, but you can remain by the river. And that's what happened to them when they were burned. They weren't in this like place of the barking dog. They remained even at the moment of their death, which is really what a spiritual adept is all about really. Um, at that moment of death, of transition, despite the pain of the body being burnt alive, they remained in that place of the river flowing, that mm. place of peace, despite the dogs barking, you know? Mm. Oh, that's um, beautiful. So it's interesting the word blood came through, and that obviously wants to be present on the core, and that's about something to do with bloodline. Mm. And what I'm feeling is that the Cathar were bloodline, partly, of Mary Magdalene. Um, okay, so what I'm getting from this is that there were, even though the Cathar were beyond class um, and were all equal, there were aristocrats of the Cathar who were protectors of the Cathar, who were Cathar, who were bloodline. Mm. And so... And by bloodline, we're all special and unique and beautiful. We all carry the codes. Um, but by bloodline, I mean, there were some who, who were carrying that line through the Magdalena and beyond. And that was seeded by beings from other planets. And so this is going through to Isis. And um, I'm also getting Richard of Lionheart coming in with this. So he was the son of Eleanor. And um, so um, I could talk quite a lot about Richard. Maybe I should do that on another interview. Mm. Well, we could do another one. So yeah. fascinating. <laughs> I'm well, receiving a transmission as you're talking right now. Well, well he's coming through and he comes through with, with the Arthur, Arthur energy, you know. Mm. Um, I've had visions of him receiving this uh, light initiation, this consolamentum, which was the Cathar baptism, which is happening now in 21, not through him, but direct from source and spirit from Magdalena, from goddess. And this happens on my ceremonies. And I 
I have had visions of Richard Lionheart receiving this direct from Goddess by a river, actually in the south of England, and a very sacred site where I live, in fact. And then I later Googled to, to realise he was, in fact, here. Um, and so I've had this image very clearly. I've seen him drinking from the chalice, and I feel like he was the last one, the last monarch to drink directly from that chalice that's my feeling mm. um, that's what I'm getting and that now it's the time to restore that and now it's the time where we may all drink from that chalice um, so he's coming in very strongly um, he obviously had was very closely linked to south of France um, his his wife Berengaria de Navarre was a Spanish noblewoman she lived in France she was very pious. She was a Cathar. She had a difficult life because she was absolutely devoted to him, but she only saw him a few times. But she completely believed in him as a spiritual mission. And she was a Cathar, but she was lonely and alone in a very difficult time. And um, she connected with the church and she she was persecuted by the church really, but had the you know and by the royals as well. She was a queen of England who never went to England. I think she did later in her life a couple of times. Um, but luckily she was protected by her Spanish family. Um, and yeah, so she just bringing her into that into this as well with Richard because you know we talk about the man and the woman, and I want to see her. Richard and Berengaria reunited and I want to restore Berengaria to her place mm. to um so that they're both drinking from the chalice and just feeling the energy of that so they didn't have children um um so I'll just leave it there with that beautiful mm. image <laughs> beautiful yeah beautiful yeah. transmission coming through as well as you were talking mm. thank you to all these beings mm. um thank you and um i'm glad this is happening this is hap happening for the greater good mm. and many people are reconnecting with that truth with mm. the cathar restoring their the true meaning of what the Katha was all about, they're teaching their light, restoring what the Magdalene is all about. It is happening. Mm. It is happening. It happened. It, it, it happened and it is happening right now. And the more, I mean, the more people will start to connect with that again, the bigger this truth will, it, as if it will take more mass mm. and it will really uh, mm. start to shift yeah it's definitely um, happening it is definitely happening this yeah message that we were talking about that magdalena always brings to me that if you want to change the world start by going within with yourself mm -mm. and this is how people are starting to shift i mean I, I really respect and honor people protesting absolutely so but i also saying it's about doing the inner work too and mm. going within and looking at your uh your own demons and clearing them and reuniting that male and female to become mm. whole and aligned mm. within you like you were saying yeah and so it's happening for so many people and so also uh, yeah I just really like to complete with that message that just one person sitting on their own you don't have to go out and do anything amazing just sitting which you know or you can that'd be wonderful but just sitting on your own the power of your prayer mm. and the power of your meditation creates a, a zeitgeist a ripple uh, that other people then start connecting and picking up on and that is happening lights are just being turned absolutely off. yeah Mm. This is what I do. Um, I mean, just like you do, you, you get lots of like insights and truth and programs that we've been told are now, I could see the truth and the reason. I mean, so many things are happening. Just, just the other day I was watching a, um, a show and I could see what, they, what the show was generating within us. Mm. Um, pressing on abandonment being 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 left 
uh left not alone but on the side you know like oh you're a loser mm. so you are no longer part of this group mm. what it creates on a on a psychological level one little tv show you're talking about one little lead tv yeah. show but how it is embedded with traumatic things it's it looks very innocent but yeah. it is it is traumatic competition you got to be the best yeah. you got to you got to you got to eliminate yeah. others yeah. to survive i mean everything is a form of hypnosis so we're talking about the transmissions coming through in this meeting and so just think of yeah like you say one tv show the energy when you listen to politicians speak you're not mm-hmm. receiving a word you're receiving an energy and activity absolutely is that yeah i could see yeah. it yeah i've got two teenagers who are um totally you know despite having two parents who uh, who live and breathe it and are about everything else they're still and they're at an alternative school but they're mm. still obsessed with tiktok and instagram and but the mainstream stuff like you talk about you same. know it's yeah. exactly the same it's very hard to protect children. and so what i find is when you do the inner work those truths just just come to you like in a blink of an eye and you're like oh, wow i could see it play out i could see what they what this show is creating within us and how how it is pressing on those traumas that we carry mm. but when you you come to a point where you do the work where those truths are just popping in front of you and you see them playing out mm. right and so that creates a shift it's like you've taken yourself away you've unplugged yourself away from that consciousness and so that work in and of itself so what i do and i mean everybody does what they do but what i've done was to cleanse it so i've actually started doing a lot of healing and clearing cleansing and transmutation at the seed point and then the work that was done i've literally packaged it and put it within the earth the grid of the earth and the collective consciousness for people to start picking into it mm, and to yes. start plugging themselves into that alternative mm. truth mm. which is more more alike to the truth than what we've been told or what is being shown to us mm. you know just uh, it's just it's just like we have to unplug ourselves from that from repetition of like traumas you know on a on a daily basis just by watching a show it's like it's pressing you traumas constantly mm. you know playing the you know i mean we, we we started to learn when we were little to actually compete with one another right mm. we had to be the first one because the first one was the the best one the hero the one who would get a star or things like that right and if you're not you well people don't want to be with you because look you're not you're not the you're not the alpha male or the you know what i mean so nobody wants to be with you and that creates all these tension within us because those patterns are are being almost embedded within us and throughout our lives all we do we're trying to be the the best one we're trying to eliminate others we're trying to be praised we're trying to be because all we want is actually we want to love you want to be loved we want to belong that's all we want mm-hmm. you know we want to be we want to be a part of be connected with others we want to be seen for who we are you know we want our truth to be mm. to be alive within us mm. and to be seen by others but also respected so this is ultimately what we want on a collective level but yeah, yeah. those kind of programs are pressing all the wrong buttons because we haven't been really um bathing in uh, in honoring our truth we haven't been really taught to love ourselves we haven't been really taught to actually mm. honor ourselves and and feel worthy mm. so each time we see those um shows which are which we watch to actually relax we're just pressing on all these buttons and all these traumas that we have mm. and it's terrible yeah, and, and you, you 
do learn to love yourself yes <laughs> yeah the, yeah that's what my son is facing at the moment he's never been able to belong so he was in a normal school but he didn't belong there because he wasn't like the other mm. boys he didn't want to play football and rugby he wasn't interested mm. in you know he was very different so then um eventually we uh it's a whole long story anyway now mm. he's in an alternative school which is where he wants to be we have mm. an educator as well but he wants to be in an alternative school because he wants to go to school but now all the people in this alternative school where he was really happy and they're all supposedly alternative like <laughs> whatever that means they're all now wearing masks uh. and he's gone in to school without a mask and I've told the school he's not going to be wearing a mask, whereas his sister wants to wear a mask. So she's wearing a mask. She knows she doesn't have to. <laughs> she mm. knows the teachers know that she's mask exempt, but she still wants to fit in. So she's actually prepared to inhibit her breathing. <laughs> mm. long. And whereas my son is doesn't want to start the only I think the only reason he didn't want to wear it is because of vanity I think that was because he started getting a few little spots mm. so he decided he would be mask exempt after all but now he's got to sit there in class everything you were just saying of not belonging because he's not wearing a mask and that's really interesting symbolism isn't it so if you do step into and I'm not saying he is or isn't but if you do step into your self-worth mm. and you're feeling differently to the mass Mm. hypnosis mm -hmm. the it. mass hypnosis that's quite a lot to hold so when for people listening you know who wherever you are on the path whether you've been awake the whole life or whether you've literally just woken up to all of this walk is one thing being awake and listening to an interview of two people who you're not actually physically with and don't actually know in a different part of the world but then turning that off and going off into the world off into your family off to meet your friends when you're not the same is very very hard mm. if, you know or finding a tribe a like-minded tribe and even a, you know like my minded tribe <laughs> might not be that like-minded because we're all unique anyway yes absolutely and this is why we want to be part of the tribe but at the same time we want our truth our uh, our own little song to be played out and we want it to be honored and respected just like we want we, we we it's important to honor someone else's truth as well so that's what we want being a part of the group but at the same time being able to express who we truly are and if we manage collectively to come to that space to that place it would be wonderful mm. it would be wonderful I, I find it very hard having been on this path all my life and um, I'm sure people listening can relate to this and finally getting to a point where I'm feeling quite uh, liberated in who I am and then suddenly all of this craziness is broken out in the world and I find myself like I personally don't wear a mask for my own reasons but I find myself in a shop um, feeling absolute discrimination <laughs> thrown at me for not wearing a mask and mm -hmm. having to hold that is a massive massive thing just having to go into a shop without a mask mm -hmm. and feeling those vibes from yeah. some people not everybody is really huge yeah mm. wow yeah it requires strength inner strength yeah yeah mm. yeah well, you you are embodying your truth and your authenticity so that's what we need we need to more people more authentic people so that we can shift mm. what's what's being imposed upon us mm. being fully uh, in our truth and in our authenticity mm. and so that our authenticity is also respected mm. and not frowned upon mm. yeah mm. well <laughs> thank you so much Happy for today day. thank you it was a lovely it was lovely chatting with you uh, thank you for all your wisdom and uh, everything that you said about the cathars, um, it was really helpful to me because I, I knew I knew little. I've definitely connected straight away with the energies during the ceremony, so I knew something was there. Mm. But um, now that you've clarified a few things, I think it 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 is more helpful to know what we're doing and why we're doing it as well. 
uh, it's almost giving it more meaning, you know, restoring the light of the Magdalene and the energy of Lemuria, you know, like, so all of that is, I mean, I'm just summarizing mm -hmm. <laughs> what everything you've said, but um, this is ultimately what we're doing. So if you're watching, if you're still watching us, please, um, you can do those ceremonies that Ishtara Rose um, kindly, um, she, she ran those beautiful ceremonies and you will see they're very, very powerful. So if you resonate with this work, if you resonate with the Cathars, I invite you to check out her, her, her page, uh, the Cathars of Life. Life. And you can also follow her page, Ishtara Rose, on Facebook as well, which I do. And it's, and it's filled with uh, nuggets of wisdom and you post regularly. And it's always, um, it really actually helps me to understand more about even what a priestess does. Do you know what I mean? It really actually, I find it very helpful to read your posts. And they're so well written as well. And they're very... Um, I find it very easy to read you because you, the way you write is very, is filled with light and filled with love. So each time I feel like my consciousness is expanding. So that's my, that's my experience of your work. But everybody who is listening to, to us, you will have your own experience with the work of Ishtara Rose. So would you like to say anything before we close this interview, mm -hmm. this conversation? Yes, everything. We said a lot. Yeah, we said a lot. Summarized it that it's just we are restoring and have restored the light codes. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you so much, Ishtara. Uh, please feel free to share it, um, and feel free to share it with people you think will be interested by um, this work, this interview. Um, feel free to comment as well or like this video. You can follow me um, on Facebook at nesdi.official or on Instagram as well and YouTube. And I will post all your links below this video as well in the description, the description box down below. And I will also add the names of the book we talked about and the first interview we've done. So you can actually, um, you can actually check them out if you want to. Thank you so much, everybody. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Until next time. Bye. <laughs>